This is the Rich Dad Radio Show. The good news and bad news about money. Here's Robert Kiyosaki. Hello, hello, it's Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show, and we're back. You can listen to the Rich Dad Radio Show anytime, anywhere on Android, iTunes, and YouTube. And then when you do, please leave a review of whatever you listen to. Did you like it? Did you hate it? What did you miss? What, what, what should we have done better? And all of our programs are archived at richdadradio.com. We archive them for one reason, is because we do not, we're not financial advisors. We do not tell you to invest for the long term in a well-diversified portfolio of stocks, bonds, mutual funds, and ETFs. We don't do that stuff. But we do want to advise people what we do, what's different than all this. So if you listen to this program again, because we're an education company only, you'll pick up 10 more distinctions that you missed the first time you listened to. And the second reason we archive at richdadradio.com this podcast and all podcasts, especially if we have friends, family members, and business associates, and that idiot brother-in-law of yours, they should listen to this. Because our guest today is a very, very important guest. His name is Paul Pagnato. And he's talking about what's really going on under the sheets at Wall Street and why he was named Barron's top financial advisor and Forbes' top wealth advisor in one of the most corrupt industries other than pharmaceuticals in the world. So you get named Barron's top financial advisor and Forbes' top wealth advisor after the transformation or before? Correct. The, after that, is, that is after. And when I, when I had walked, this was eight years ago, when, when I had walked away from everything, um, we had, that was overseeing about a billion dollars in assets. And now we have quadrupled that. We have $4 billion dollars and assets that we advise on. And what I've found is not just through my personal experience, but when you study the companies that are leading the markets, companies that are breaking out, companies that have the strongest trust and brand recognition, these are all companies that have taken transparency to a whole new level in their industry. And what, what are some examples of some of those companies, Paul? So, Uber is an example. So you think, think about it. Before Uber, you ordered a cab. You didn't know exactly what the price was going to be. You didn't know where they were. You didn't know who the driver was. You didn't know what kind of car was going to pick you up. You, you, had, you did not have transparency in all of that. Today, you do right at your fingertips. Apple. Apple is doing an amazing job with privacy standards. Tim Cook has really put his companies out. You can Google Apple privacy standards and they list them all. Whereas some of the other technology companies, as we know, haven't done that. Like Facebook, that's why they're in trouble, right? (laughs) Yes, exactly. Like Facebook. I mean, Mark Zuckerberg had testified before Congress that their algorithms weren't completely transparent. Now, the positive is that he had to testify before Congress. And the positive is they're changing and there's becoming a lot more transparency around these sophisticated algorithms. So these, these companies that are growing exponentially and I believe will continue to lead this decade have this DNA of transparency and they have these traits. I I label them the six T's of transparency. And if a company or department within a company, any, or an entrepreneur follows these six T's, and they're not that complicated, you'll become exponentially transparent. And so can you'll you give have us unbelievable trust. So can you give us one of the T's? You bet. Terms. So if a client has very complicated terms or contract with the public uh, or with their clients, you lose, you lose trust. The, the simpler, the easier the terms are, the more trust that you have. So it's, it's actually, you want to make it ridiculously simple, right? If you have to read five pages of legalese that you cannot understand, that should be a red flag. that something's going on behind the scenes. It shouldn't be that way. So these companies have simplistic terms. They also have transparent cost. So most of these companies, you can Google, and you can find out exactly what the cost is for the product or service. When somebody hymns and haws and it's all complicated or it's complicated formula as to what the cost is with something, that's usually a red flag. So there's these six T's 
that can be used and followed as guidelines, guardrails to help any company, any entrepreneur, any person working within a company, with their department, uh, to, to transform the culture to transparency. And, you know, one of your, one of your T's, which I think is one of the most important is trust. And Mm -hmm. from personal experience, um, we've dealt with a lot of people who we didn't trust and that wreaked havoc everywhere. So actually our policy is we really pretty much only deal with people who we, who we trust. How, how does that play out in, in your world? So trust is the pinnacle of the other five T's. So once you follow those five T's, you do have trust. And I'll give you an example of that. Uh, Jack Bogle was the founder of Vanguard. He was the first one to create a completely transparent, low-cost mutual fund, which now led into the whole ETF industry. Today, there are more in asset under management at Vanguard than J.P. Morgan, Goldman Sachs, and Merrill Lynch combined. It's just staggering. So Jack took transparency to the mutual fund space to a whole new level. And look what's happened. There's unbelievable trust. But wasn't it also because what, you know, I'm not in the uh, paper asset. I'm not in your world. Um, But the way I understood it with Vanguard and all that wasn't a, a lot because he had lower fees. ETFs? Yes. Yes. But that wasn't the only reason? Trans- yes, you had total transparency on what the cost is, and he brought the cost down. You had total transparency of what's being owned, so there's no manipulation. So the terms were very, very sim- simple. There was total accountability. So because it's in the prospectus, they fought with the SEC, this is exactly what they're going to do. These are the companies. This is a discipline. They have complete complete transparency, very simple terms, low, low cost. And so, 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 so let, me, let me ask you a question. So give me the, give me the bad side of it. What were the other guys doing? What were the, you can name those scumbags if you want, but, but <laughs> what, what are, and they're probably still doing it. Cause I was just, like I said, I was just, I was just in New York and talking to the uh, wall street journal reporter and she has no trust of your industry. She says, I said, how many people, in the money management world are on us. She says less than 10%. Unfortunately, uh, I have to concur with that. The pure fact that there's less than 1% of the industry, of the companies or the advisors that follow these 10, we call it true fiduciary, these 10 true fiduciary standards, which strip out the conflicts of interest. I, I sums, understand, but t- that up. G- give us a bad example. It's, it's really nice to talk about heaven, but I want to find out what hell yeah. sounds like. Well, let's talk about a bad example that everyone um, knows about at a high level, and I'll drill down and provide more transparency and clarity. Bernie Madoff. See, Bernie Madoff did what he did for 20 years. But did it have the perfect name? He, I mean, shouldn't it have been warned? <laughs> you know, if you had a name Madoff. like Madoff, <laughs> Madoff. Or, or how about if it was F.U.? You know, he goes, well, I better not work with a guy named F.U. You know what I mean? Madoff, he was telling you. Everybody should have known. <laughs> and he still got away with it. Well, the crazy thing is, he never got caught. I know. I mean, he never got caught after and, 20 years. He had to turn himself but, in. How did, how, so how did and, he get away with it? Well, this is, this is what's important for, for the, the listeners to, to understand. He got away with it because the things he did, which I'll walk through right now, were legal. Like he was able to do those things, and I'll sh- explain how, but they haven't changed the laws. All those things are still legal today. So when he was audited, he, Bernie Madoff was able to be the advisor and also collect the money. So people wrote checks to him. That's a conflict of interest. Bernie Madoff was able to be the advisor and obtain commissions for the money. Bernie Madoff, and that's allowed today, Bernie Madoff was allowed to be the advisor and also generate the client statements. And the, and, and fraudulently the, did. And that's when that guy, what, what was his name? The, um, the whistleblower who never made any money, Mark Hopp, Mark Hopp or something? Um, the guy that blew um, the whistle. Um, I, I, I'm not sure, okay. but 
But the, how, how he but caught the, the, everybody should know this. Yeah. The, reason, the reason they caught him was yeah. because his 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 returns were a straight line. They kept going up, and that should tell exactly. you something. You know, that, that, that's, those that's are red exactly flags. Right. That's, that's what I want to get at, because otherwise we're going to stay in theory, Paul. And we, I mean, we, you know, we had rich that like to get down to the dirt. The dirt is a lot more <laughs> fun. So we come back. This is we're going to take, I have to take a break. And when we come back with Paul, I want, I want a little bit more dirt rather than happy camp here. We'll be right back. So um, we were talking, Paul, about Bernie Madoff and how Bernie Madoff got away with what he got away with. And you said because everything he's doing – he was doing was legal, not ethical, but legal. What tell us, tell us more. That's correct. Yeah. So the regulators haven't changed the laws. The regulators still allow an advisor to calculate their performance returns for their clients and generate client statements and receive commissions and all these items. So it's up to you. So it's up to you as an investor to not allow that. And you vote with your pocketbook. You can't rely and count on the regulators to protect against those things. So it's up to you. You vote with your pocketbook. And if you don't place your money with an institution or with an advisor that's not, we call it true fiduciary, you'll, you'll change the system. But because Paul, then but they Paul, will Paul be how does the average change. person, Paul, please, man, how does the average person know? I mean, you know, Madoff was part of the NASDAQ or something like that. He was really a highly respected individual. But the thing that cued, I think it's Markopoulos or something like that, was that his line went straight up. Now, everybody can see that, but the average guy cannot see that. You know, most markets go up and down and all. Madoff was going straight up. But, you know, to say, you, know, you please give us more examples exactly how are they doing it today. Because we so, don't know. You're right. You're right. The average person, it's very, very difficult to follow because they make it complicated. So number one, if it's too complicated and you can't follow what your advisor's telling you, that should be a red flag. Like stop that, that, that's a red flag. So it should be very, very simple. The terms should be very, very simple. You should know exactly how your advisor and that advisor's firm is making their money. There should only be one, this is how simple it is. There should only be one source of revenue. It should be the fees that you're paying your advisor. That's it, period, end of discussion. If they're receiving compensation in any other shape or form outside of the fee you're paying for advice, there's conflicts. So that's one way to think about it and to drill down and look. So you just ask your advisor, how they're paid, what are the sources of revenue, do not accept anything. Of it. And there are thousands and thousands of advisors that you can hire and enter a relationship where you're just paying them for the advice. I understand, Paul, but the transparency takes, the, the corruption takes place after the advisor. You know, like I said, I was just on Wall Street last week. And the corruption that goes on Bill, after the money is corrupt, like what do they do with that money? Where does it go to? Where, you know, how, who, who gets the money after the money is co collected? Follow the money. Yep. How does the average person yep. do that? Yep. Well, what is happening is you see a massive shift occurring to FinTech, the financial technology companies. It could be in a company like Venmo, Right? There's no cost for me to transfer money to you through Venmo. That's an example. There are robo-advisors that are much pure, much cleaner. I'm not saying there's still not some, some issues there, but they're much, much, much better. And then there are lenders, fintech lenders, that are much, much better. In the last seven years, personal loans were only 5% in fintech online. Today, in seven years, it's now over 40%. The digital advisors have grown 80% last year. So digital advice is growing exponentially. And why is digital, the actual, why, ahead, why is digital advice better than a, a human advice? The, the, consumers, the consumers like it better because they feel there is a higher level of trust because you have more transparency, you have simpler terms, 
You can see everything 24 by 7. It's very, very automated, and that is extremely appealing to uh, the, 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 the generation coming up. So that's why you see literally there's over a trillion dollars in assets there, and in the next two, three years, there'll be another trillion dollars of assets. So this is where, this is where things are headed. And that is a positive. It is not a negative because the more things are digitized, the more transparency you have and the opaqueness gets pulled out of it. So this is where the assets are flowing. This is where people are looking for solutions and obtaining solutions more and more. Now, what we do with our company, where we feel the best of all worlds, is a combination of both where you're using digital tools and technology to have really simple terms. You're only paying a fee for the advice. You can see everything. You have full transparency, 24 by seven, but then you also have a person, a human being to talk to when you want to talk to somebody because you know, we, we all go through difficult times and difficult. We have difficult situations that we deal with from time to time. And it's nice to speak to a human being. So, I think the best of all worlds is to have high touch, but also high tech, a combination of so, both. So let, let's talk for a minute about Wall Street, because Wall Street is pretty corrupt, yes? <laughs> it's pretty corrupt. How does, how do you... It has, a, how, it has a track record of being very corrupt. Yeah, so how does the transparency, how does that, how, how do you affect Wall Street when it's such a huge monster and they're all about fees and they're all about greed and they're all about taking as much money as they can and screwing everybody else? Yeah. So you, you have the arrangements with wall street to be project based fee based versus commission based commissions immediately trigger conflicts and, um, and, and bad, bad behavior, not necessarily in the best interest of, of, of the consumer Two, more and more digital digitization. So, you know, I was, I was, and it's happening. I was on wall street. I was there on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. There's really not a whole lot going on. It's all become digitized. And digitization is getting cleaner and cleaner. It's not perfect. We're in this process, and that's why I wrote the book, The Transparency Way. So it's, 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 under, it's underway, but it's, it's still going to take time. There's still issues to, to get worked out. But the more it's digitized, the less opaqueness, the less places people have to manipulate the system. But isn't that kind of all what, documented? Go ahead. Right, so it, isn't that what gives Bitcoin its power? It's, it's called, you know, blockchain underneath of it. Blockchain is, is, it's here. It's here to stay. But it's isn't that, is, but isn't that you're saying the same thing with when it comes to money? It, that's what you, when you, I'm, I'm just trying to get to speak the layman's yeah. language to understand because I understand what yeah. you're saying, Paul, but you're not making much sense to me right now. So when you talk about <laughs> digitized, I'm talking. Are you talking about yeah, Bitcoin? But what give, what gives Bitcoin power is blockchain because it's basically everything is there recorded for posterity, everybody to see, and not one individual can manipulate it. Is that what you're saying when that you call is, it digitized? Th yes, that is what I'm saying. So when a uh, financial transaction is digitized, there is a permanent record that is stored and it, you have full transparency and everybody can see it. So Paul, what Similar happens, to, what, what happens to, after, uh, Paul, 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 what happens after, after you transfer your money? How do you follow the money after that? That's my well, question. You should, yeah. So you should always be able to see and view your assets. So if you purchase uh, security or you transfer money from point A to point B, you should always be able to see it. Okay. So the technology and the tools are, are in place for an individual to always be able to, to see and view okay. the well, movement of the money. Well, Paul, you know, thank you very much. For, you know, thanks for writing your book, Transparency Wave, Expon Exponential Changes That Will Transform Our World. It's it's we're, we're, we're there, we're going into the digitized world, it's the invisible world, but there's more tools coming up that'll make things more apparent for other people to make better decisions of who you trust your money to. And personally right now, I don't trust anybody on Wall Street. And transparency changes everything. Right. 
All right. So thank you very thank much. Thank you, Paul. Thank you for your work. Good we'll look to forward to your book. Uh, well, thank you for your time. Much appreciated. Thanks for pushing me there, Rob. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Bye-bye. Take care. Yeah. Hello, Robert Kiyosaki, back with the Rich Dad Radio Show, the good news and bad news about money. Once again, listen to the Rich Dad Radio program anytime, anywhere on iTunes, Android, and YouTube now. And leave us a comment or a review whenever you listen to this program. We'd like to hear from you. What did you want to hear? What did you not hear? Uh, What can we do better? Also, all of our programs are archived at richdadradio.com. We archive them because we're not a financial advisor. You know, we are a financial education company. So if you listen to this program one more time, your comprehension of what was said will double. I promise you that because repetition is how we learn. But more importantly, get your friends, family, and business associates to listen to this program especially, especially if they have what's called a 401k or they have a pension with the state or they're giving their money to Wall Street because that's where the money disappears. So I want to thank our guest today, Paul Pagnato. He was named Barron's top financial advisor and Forbes top wealth advisor. And, you know, to do that, you got to be pretty good. And he's coming out with his latest book, Transparency Wave, Exponential Changes That Will Transform Our World. And he was talking about how he was transformed after he found out how Wall Street was screwing their clients. And he mentioned Bertie Madoff. And I, I keep saying, you should have listened to his name, Madoff. He's telling you something. Any comments, Kim? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I like the, the book Transparency Wave. I like the title. I mean, we know from personal experience, the more transparent we are just as a, as a company, uh, the better off we are. And when I get in trouble, there's times where I try to hide things, uh, sh- shovel them under the table or something like that. So the, the whole concept of transparency and being forthright and honest with numbers and things like that, I think is very, very important. The, the key is in, in your investments and wall street and your stocks how do you how do you as an individual uncover the facts and the transparency i mean it's pretty it's pretty well layered and so, hidden so, so let me be so blatant and shamelessly publish or promote my latest book called who stole my pension and it's out now and is with uh, ted sadell edward ted sadell and the reason that's important is because I just came off of Wall Street last week, and now I'm talking to Paul. And I don't think he knows. He said, well, it's good, you know, your your robo-advisor or whatever they're talking about now. Oh, yeah, we have good records of your money right now. That's not the problem, sports fans. That they have good records of your money being deposited is not the problem. Like I said, we just wrote this book called Who Stole My Pension with Edward Ted Sedell. And Ted Sedell is an SEC attorney, and he stopped being an SEC attorney, much like Paul Pagnato, when he saw what was happening with your money after it was deposited. See, look, it's not a matter of you having good records and simple contracts. It's que pasa, as my friends would say in Spanish-speaking countries. What do they do with the money? And the, and the story of who stole my pension, I was on Wall Street last week with Ted and I tell you, it made me angry. I mean, it's a great book, Who Stole My Pension? But hanging out with Ted, I found out how pervasive, how damaging, and how at risk people are. Because Paul is correct. Nothing has changed. They're still stealing your money. And most people have money in Wall Street for one primary reason, your pension. And listen to this. This is my prediction. For 2020 and on, this, this ten, next 10 years, pensions are going to be the biggest story we hear. Because the old guys like me are out of time. We cannot save any more. If they steal any more of it, you know, they're going to be moving in with their kids or the kids are going to be moving with them because they got student loan debt. We've been all ripped off here. Everybody's ripping everybody off right now. So I was just on Wall Street with Ted. So listening to Paul, I'm going, holy mackerel. The problem is not that they keep good records. The problem is what do they do with the money after they deposit it? Well, even, I mean, even to Ted's point, that's why he left is because here he was managing people's money. He felt responsible for these people's Uh, money who worked. Paul. I mean, Paul, excuse me. So um, Paul was managing all this money of his clients and he wanted to do right by them. But even after his clients had to deposit it, all of his, their money with Paul and his, Paul's firm, it was still, there was still that temptation. This bank calls and says, put all your clients into our bonds so you can save our bank. 
Well, if Paul didn't have the integrity to say no, a lot of most will say yes. And so just to your point, Robert, once they deposit that money with these investment banks and investment advisors, who knows where it goes and what that game is? And I certainly point, don't. What I got Paul to try and say is that if he had moved that money and all the money disappeared, it's still within the law. Yeah. Yeah. And they're doing it every day. They can lose billions and it's still within the law and they're protected. I, I wish you had said that. Like I said, just last week, I'm sitting on Wall Street talking to the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and Barron's and Bloomberg reporters. And I asked, I asked a Wall Street Journal reporter, I said, what percent of the people on Wall Street are honest? She said, less than 10%. She says, they're all out to take your money. And it, it, it just made me sick. So the book is called Who Stole My Pension? You should read in there about how, because Ed Sedell, Ted Sedell, is a guy who writes about how your pensions are stolen. If you have a defined benefit pension plan, I'm more into the 401k site, defined contribution site. But ladies and gentlemen, when you turn your money over to these financial advisors, I don't care if they're robo or not robo, they're gonna steal your money. Their whole job is to steal your money. And if you don't know anything about it, then you can trust Paul and say, well, just find a good guy and all this stuff. The whole job was to steal your money. So the question is, once you put your money in there, even though the guy is honest, let's say Paul is honest, what does the what does his company do with that money? And that's what we cover in Who Stole My Pension. It goes from the public banking market to the private banking system. It's called a shadow banking system. And I don't know if you've been following this right now, but the biggest crash just occurred a few weeks ago. It's it's in called the repo market, the repurchase market. They're bankrupt. Right now, in the last six months, the U.S. Federal Reserve has put $3 trillion into the repo market because the money is gone. They're trying to keep this thing afloat right now. So the book is called Who Stole My Pension? And that's what I write about. So I'm glad Paul is talking about being transparent with your broker, but your broker, as we say at Rich, is broker than you because he's stealing your money for Wall Street. And it's exactly why we started the Rich Dad Company is because people blindly turn their money over to expecting some advi financial advisor to manage their money better than they can. And Trust it's me. like, it's like, yeah, it's like our friend who's a politician and he's not really a politician because he's fighting for really fighting for people. But he said, if any politician, including myself, tells me, tells you that they're doing this in your best interest, just know they're lying. And I think that's Wall Street. They're not doing anything in their best interest. They're doing it in the best interest of Wall Street. So again, we have Rich Dad Company because you've got to be responsible for your money and not turn it blindly over to Wall Street and other people to, to steal. So if you're a millennial, just know they already stole your money through this thing called student loans. Oh, student loan debt subject, is now yes. student loan oh. debt is now bigger than the subprime mortgage that we oh. nearly brought down the world in 2008. It's handcuffed our youth. It's, uh, they're screwing you. Yep. Oh, go to school. <laughs> you know, we'll give you a loan. And you, like, like a little robot, you just go in there and you take the, you learn nothing about money. So, so the New York Times the other day uh, came out with this, there's little snippets of people that they talk to on the street and how much debt do you have? Bad debt. How much bad debt do you have? Most of them was student loan debt. And three out of 10 said, well, the problem is we're not taught anything about money. And we don't know what to do. So we get out of school and now we have this, this noose around our neck and we can barely breathe because we can't pay it off and we can't get a job. So and so that's please the, listen, the, the book problem. is called Who Stole My Pension with Ed, Ted Sedell. The reason there's two authors, Ted and myself, is there's two kinds of pensions, defined benefit, which is teachers, firefighters, uh, police officers, and labor union guys. You know, there's one guy in the book, he... He re, he's a retired teamster. You don't mess with teamsters. You know, they drive trucks. <laughs> and his pension he worked for, and I will mention the name, it's called UPS. They stole his pension. Mm -hmm. So he was getting $4,000 a month as a pensioner, and he says it's now 800 a month. They said, congratulations, you just lost three quarters of your pension. Wow. And the rioting in Paris, France right now, as we're talking, is because of pensions. Japan is toast. They've stolen all their money out of their pensions. And so I'm, I'm really happy for Paul. It's happy camp. You know, he thinks the broker is on their side. The broker is just the first, it's like, the, it's like talking to the teller at the bank, but the bank robbery is going on inside the vault. 
If you can get that picture, ladies and gentlemen, you'll know why the Rich Dad Company is in existence today. You gotta find out what's going on inside the vault. So like last week, I'm sitting on Wall Street listening to Ted Sedell talk to some of the smartest, all women, by the way, women reporters, man, they're, doesn't they're deadly. Su- doesn't surprise Sarah or myself. They're <laughs> deadly. I, I, I said to um, the Wall Street Journal reporter, I said, I'm just glad you're not investigating me because they're vicious. And then all of a sudden I realized why, because the guys are hiding in the vault, stealing the money are very smart. They have firewalls all over the place. You cannot touch them. So Paul Pagnotto is correct. You know, they're doing everything. The guy taking your money is not the problem. It's like the teller's not the problem. It's the guy inside the vault. And that's the big difference here. Like, you know, inside who stole my pension, a lot of my friends are in there. You know, they're pilots for United Airlines. They got their money stolen out of their pension. I have pilots right now who are calling me up saying, you know, I'm, I'm still working. I can't fly anymore because I'm too old. But they've, their pension was stolen. And so hear what I'm saying. Pensions will be the biggest story for this decade, 2020 to 2030, because they're all looted. Right now, right now in Paris, they're rioting because they're going after their pensions. Our, our governments are broke. And who's going to pay for this pension mistake? Not Wall Street. The taxpayer will pay for it eventually. And the student, student loan debt is already a disaster. They're still stealing from you guys. So that's why the biggest mistake is to go to school and not learn anything about money. Final words, Kim. I th- no, no, just wrap it up. Okay. Oh, that was yeah, that was a great. Yeah. Way to end it. So I want to hear from Sarah because she's a younger generation. <laughs> she still has time. <laughs> Sarah, what do you think about the old, the old guys like me? You know, I mean, I just, you know, I just turn. I'll turn seventy three this year. I'm one over par in the golf course. <laughs> so, if I was broke right now, can I come live with you? <laughs> what do you think about all this as a younger person? I think nobody will understand. To be honest, this is a subject nobody talks about. I was glad we talked about Bernie Madoff in the in the start, um, yeah. to start it because I think that's a story people understand. There's been movies about, about it. it, yeah. But I think the grand scheme of things, people don't understand how big this is and how widespread this is. Um, I was just reading something on Chicago's pension, you know, the city pensions for Chicago. And would you say that that's a form, you know, like the pensions, the the money goes into mutual funds or whatever the city does with them, right? So who's in charge of that at that point? But what happens after that? They right, go, yeah. That's who's in saying. charge it, of it. it. No, no, please listen, okay? There's yeah. two types of finances. There's public and private. So the money goes into the public market, which is stocks, bonds, mutual funds, ETS, what Paul sells. From there, it goes to private. It goes to private equity hedge funds and all that. Kim and I are Wall private. Street. Kim and I, no, no, the Wall Street's both. Kim and I are, are private. We're called, in the trade, we're called a family office. We manage our own money. Mm-hmm. The average person doesn't have the education to do that. Right. So the average person, all they see is the broker, you know, Merrill Lynch or Goldman, I don't know who, don't know who, they, who those guys are. Vanguard. Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo. Oh. Oh, that's who Ted's going. I shouldn't say that. Anyway, (laughs) but but anyway, ladies and gentlemen, that's why you listen to Rich Dad and Rich Dad Radio and all this, because even if you don't understand it, just hear me clearly. Because of a lack of financial education, somebody's got their money in your pocket, and that's not a mistake. Mm -hmm. The reason there's no financial education in schools because the school system is just as corrupt. How in the world can they charge kids like $50,000 to go to school and not teach them anything about money. Those school, those college professors should be locked up and sent off with Bernie Madoff. That's what's mm-hmm. going on. Mm-hmm. So that's why the Rich Dad Company was formed, how many years ago now, Kim? 20 22 years, years ago. And it's still going on. So anyway, Sarah, thanks for setting this, this yep. program up. And everybody, please listen to this. Remember, who's, who's got their hand in your pocket? Thank you for listening.
Hãy subscribe cho